is the third day of the eighth month of the year 2021. Welcome to the most authoritative hour on TV. It's The Pulse. We're live from our studios in Kukum Limli on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Remember, we are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. This afternoon, latest study reveals the Delta strain has finally taken over infections in Ghana, constituting about 90% of community spread in the country. This afternoon, we'll hear from the Ghana Medical Association who wants government to enforce the protocols. Our data is just confirming what was inevitable because uh, everywhere Delta has been, it has taken over. So also this afternoon, 12 regions on red alert over a possible outbreak of bed flu. As the Veterinary Services Department say, its officers in the four remaining regions have been asked to put in measures to prevent an outbreak. We have details of the country situation for you. Plus in Parliament today, a Jura MP questions report of the three-member committee that investigated the violence there, saying recommendations for the removal of the MCE alone is not enough and should have included the removal of the regional minister. We are live in Parliament for more on this. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. The Pulse is brought to you by Global Communities Dignilu Affordable Safe Sanitation. Remember, we are also streaming live on YouTube and all our social media handles. Tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. It's always a pleasure to host you. Let's start off with COVID-19 because a total of 518 new COVID-19 cases have been confirmed by the Ghana Health Service as of 30th July 2021. It takes the country's active case count to 6,276. Out of that, 17 are critical and 86 severe. COVID-19 has also um, taken 844 lives already let's check out the updates on uh, the screens and new cases now 518 active cases 6276 confirmed cases 105,512 death toll now at 844 and recoveries at 98,392 and let's check out the regional breakdown greater accra is leading with 57,058 followed uh, closely by Ashanti region with 18,432, Western region 6,077, followed by Eastern region 4,969, Central region follows with 3,875, and Volta region has 3,177. And you can see that the red circles that indicate uh, the uh, cases confirmed in the regions are becoming wider and wider now this afternoon we are looking at the surge in the numbers and potential super spreader events which is to be taking place tomorrow fix the country demonstration which has finally been given green light from the police in the midst of a third wave we'll unpack all the issues when the experts join us but earlier the west africa center for cell biology and infectious pathogens revealed a worrying statistics saying that the deadly covid 19 delta strain has finally taken over infections in Ghana. Director for the Centre, Gordon Awandari, who spoke earlier on Joy News, that says the latest study revealed the Delta strain constituted about 90% of community spread in the country. Our data is just confirming what was inevitable because uh, everywhere Delta has been, it has taken over. So it was just a matter of time before it dominates, and, and that has not happened. Uh, uh, what, was, what was also interesting for us is that there's, a, there's another variant which was um, making a lot of uh, progress in taking over. Uh, and then Delta has come and basically suppressed that one as well. So, But we need to keep an eye on it as well. It was one of the variants that was uh, uh, driving the outbreaks in Mauritius uh, 
a few months ago. So um, it's called a B11318. And it's it's a variant that has been in our system for a while. We need to uh, we need to keep an eye on it as we also uh, track the Delta variant. So the, the Ghana Medical Association has raised this concern about um, the need for us to be more careful. You just heard Dr. Bayo talk about um, how leadership needs to basically take that responsibility and ensure that the citizens are protected. Would you agree with the GMA position? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, that you said it all is the enforcement. Um, you know, if you look at the history of the waves we've had, the first and the second waves, Anytime we crack down on the protocols and enforce them, and people start uh, wearing their mask again at uh, a high percentage, you see that we overcome the wave, and then we come back to uh, you know, uh, you know, a certain level of uh, normalcy. So, I think that is what is required that we, you know, present a more, um, you know, uh, a more heightened state of. Uh, agency for the enforcement of the protocols and for the, the language to change from, um, you know, sort of saying that things will be okay to actually telling people that, no, if we are not careful, we can get into big trouble. Um, and, you know, if we can do that for a few weeks, I think mm. we can put, we can uh, get Delta under control as well, like we did for Alpha in January. But definitely this is the most vicious um, variant we've ever had. Uh, everywhere it has gone, it has left some damage. So I think we have to be very careful. Well, this afternoon, the Ashanti Regional Security Council says it will deploy security personnel to ensure strict compliance with the coronavirus safety protocols. The decision comes after the region recorded 304 deaths from the coronavirus pandemic. Addressing the media today, the regional minister who doubles as chairman of the Regional Security Council, Simon Osemensa, said the council will deploy security personnel to ensure strike, st strict compliance with the COVID-19 safety protocols. With the onset of the new variant, that is the Delta variant, Ashanti region has seen a very sharp upsurge in the number of cases. Because of this, it has become necessary to tighten the enforcement of the various COVID protocols within the region. And the security agencies are going to ensure that we abide by or we observe all the COVID protocols. We are urging all the metropolitan, municipal, and district chief executives to join hands with the respective security councils to undertake the following. One, ensure mandatory wearing of face masks in all communities. Two, provide Veronica backers at public places, including markets, lorry parks, and health centers. Make public announcements to increase awareness of the new wave and the need to enforce the protocols. And also, enforce all restrictions on public gatherings as spelled out in the President's 26 address to the nation on the COVID situation. With regard to public transport, Drivers are to ensure that everyone who boards their vehicle has the face mask on. In the event where the security agencies meet a commercial vehicle and a passenger is not masked, all the other passengers will be asked to alight, and the driver, the passenger, who is not wearing the mask, together with the mate, 
will be taken to the police station for the law to take its course. Wherever you will be moving in this region, please, we urge everybody to put on the face mask. And we wish to inform the general public that the security agencies will be deployed all over the region to ensure enforcement of all the COVID-19 protocols. Let's find out how the region intends to carry out this revised directive. And joining me via Zoom for the conversation is Dr. Roxon Michael E.J. He's Deputy Ashanti Regional Director of Public Health. I'm grateful for your time. Later, we'll also be joined by a virologist, Michael Owusu, from the KCCR and also a lecturer at KNUST. Um, let me start with you, Dr. E.J. How differently are these measures going to be enforced? Thank you very much and good afternoon to your viewers. Um, as the minister said, um, we have gone on the road of preaching the protocols for people to adhere, but uh, we've gotten to a stage whereby um, adherence is actually uh, not forthcoming as we expect from the input we have made with our communication. So, um, I think um, the security coming on board to ensure that people um, adhere is in the right step and we, we are in full support of it. Now, the region has uh, 1, uh, 1,253 cases. How do you intend to slow the infections? Yes. Um, where we are now, it is until people understand and uh, until uh, the steps that the minister just um, outlined have been fully enforced, uh, we may not see a downward trend in the cases. And for when adherence starts today, we, we are assured of seeing the results in two weeks' time, looking at the incubation period of the virus. So that is our trump card. Um, our first defense is to ensure that the the protocols are observed. Infection transmission is interrupted by all the things we've been preaching about wearing our mask and then also ensuring that uh, we don't crowd up or we don't gather um, in places that will cause spread of infection. So as these measures are being enforced, then we are sure that uh, we can get some results by way of um, seeing the numbers come down in the next two weeks. Doc, we're all getting worried because we are told that um, our communities have been taken over by the Delta strain. Now, what is the nature of the enforcement and its associated punitive measures that you talk about in your region? Well, uh, for, for enforcement, it's really in the bosom of the security. For us, the health aspects, we only advocate and um, advise what needs to be done. But um, I think the minister was very clear in his actions or in the um, in his outline that in Trotro, if um, someone is not wearing the mask, the entire um, passenger or the, I mean, the entire um, passenger body would have to suffer for it in that they may have to get down wherever they are for um, punitive actions to be applied to the one who was not wearing the mask and the driver. So I think uh, these are good and uh, we'll test how it goes in the weeks ahead. Dr. Roxon Michael A.J. He is the Deputy Ashanti Regional Health uh, Director. Now the Ghana Medical Association is also raising also concerns really about the surge in cases. Deputy General Secretary of the Association, Dr. Titus Bayo, wants government to enforce the protocols and double up efforts to procure vaccines to save the populace. Everything stopped with leadership, uh, leadership at various levels. We think that the leadership of the country needs to play a role, but we are also calling on individuals to take personal responsibilities for their health. And now when you talk about leadership at the national level, uh, we think that continuing to urge people to uh, obey or enforce, um, obey these protocols is not working, it's simply not working. 
So we think there's a need for some form of enforcement of the protocols. And that's where national leadership come in. If you take something like the vaccines, we think we cannot wait any longer. And we, we stated that clearly in the statement. And that is not something an individual can do for themselves. We recognize the effort government is making toward these vaccines, but it's only government that can do it for us. And so we are calling on government to work on that. And then on the individual level, we are asking people to try and uh, uh, comply with the protocols. But like I said, it will require enforcement from government. Uh, and the, 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 the forces that be to ensure that people protect mm. themselves from harm. If we are on a path of a self-destruct, we need somebody to reverse the trend. And we think that government has a responsibility to enforce these protocols on everybody. Mm. It's become so common, let me put it that way. And, and, and that's just what the story is. And, and that's why we said that our healthcare systems continue to be very fragile and we need to up our game. Because if you, if you check from the, the healthcare point of view, healthcare care point of view, uh, if you go to the northern and upper part of our country, most of our healthcare workers have received a single vaccine only. So they've not had the opportunity to get a second shot of the vaccine. If you come to the greater Accra, um, Ashanti, most people got the two shots and therefore seemingly are protected. But this Delta variant is a very, very, very stubborn one. Uh, even people who are vaccinated get the infection. And so people have genuine concerns about the rising numbers. And for us, our biggest concern is that when the numbers begin to rise and we sound the alarm bells, people get the assurance that, oh, just take it easy. These numbers are not much. We are not seeing a lot of sick people or people dying. But it's just a matter of time. We know that our capacity is better than it was in March last year. It's better than it was in March this year. But the truth is that it is just a matter of time. Mm. With these numbers going up, and if more people get critically ill and will require in-hospital care, we cannot cope. And then we'll come to the point where our phones are going to be inundated with calls or people trying to get ICU beds for relations, are trying to get oxygen for relations. And, and stuff like that. So I think it is earlier, the, the earlier we take a decision, the better it will be for all of us. Let's now go to Dr. Michael Owusu, who is a virologist with KCCR. He's also a lecturer at the KNUST. Doc, uh, I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. What does this mean that 90% of the Delta strain has taken over our communities? What does this mean? to our fight against uh, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, good afternoon uh, to you. So this for me is not surprising. Uh, it's to be expected that the Delta variant will eventually take over uh, all other variants in the system. If you remember, we started with the original Wuhan strain that has almost been taken over by the Alpha strain from the UK. And now we have the Delta, which is running very quickly and likely to overtake both the UK variant and even the South African variant. And because of the fitness of this virus, it's about 60% highly transmissible and has that kind of efficiency to be able to infect more than the, than the other one. So if you study the nature of coronaviruses, at any point in time, they try to mutate to double up their strength, to give them an edge over previous ones and take over so that they will be able to at least withstand uh, any other form of resistance that we, I mean, they, they will be exposed to um, for the human population. So this is where uh, I mean, we have to be very careful. They are able to mutate when they have that luxury in running through the population. If you don't give it a chance to run through the population, you, you are able to reduce the rate that the virus mutates or changes. But if you give the virus an opportunity to run through the system, it will, it will transform and change. So even with the Delta variant, if we are still not careful, it is possible that by the time this third wave ends, it will end with another form of the Delta, which may also be much stronger than the Delta we are seeing today. It's going to do that for some time until you are fully vaccinated and until the population is well protected to be able to stop this transmission. Until then, we have to be dealing with the forms of these viruses for some time. And, and that is where we think the protocol 
adherence is very important to slow the speed and to slow the transmission and to slow even the rate of mutation of these particular uh, viruses. Now, Doc, whilst we struggle to contain the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are also having to um, struggle to deal with the challenge of our health facilities being fragile, just like we heard the GMA say. I mean, what does this mean again for our fight? More deaths? I mean, if you study the, 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 the nature of this virus and the various epidemic we have gone through, the first wave, we had some number of deaths, but of course, in the second wave, the deaths were more than the first. So if you want to project and to predict how things will be, it is very likely that the number of deaths that this Delta strain will continue to may become more than the, than the second wave. We, and this is not definite because you, you know we have vaccinated a lot of the health worker populations. And they also, most of the vaccinated people are elderly people that have chronic underlying ailments. So to some level, we are able to protect um, these lives and to ensure that um, they'll be able to go through. But we still have a large number of people out there who are still susceptible, who are chronic ailments, who are elderly. And we even know that even for young people, they now suffer severe disease. So if things are to remain like this, and if nothing is done and people continue to behave the way we are behaving, if we don't take care by the time this third wave ends, we may likely record more deaths than what we saw in the second wave. But we have still an opportunity to, to, to break this transmission chain and to cut down on the deaths and possible spread of this virus by adhering to the protocols, which is why I'm quite happy that in the Shanti region, the minister has laid down some, uh, made a statement and, and tried to I mean, pronounce that the police are going to ensure that all people are, I mean, will adhere to these protocols. I, I have confidence that if we are able to do this quickly, we can succeed in cutting down these projected deaths and possible projected uh, transmission. But if we allow things to go through and people still behave the way we are behaving, then my fear is that we may have deaths that may be more than the second wave, and even, even the first wave. That is the fear that uh, some of us have. Um, interestingly, I mean, some time ago, we saw this whole thing working out. I mean, the enforcement, we saw the police. Whether it was a nine-day wonder, we do not know. But of course, let me ask you, should we go back to the days of stricter restrictions? I mean, closure of schools, closure of uh, um, air, sea borders, and, and, and even at worst scenario, should we go for a lockdown? Well, uh, normally in pandemics like this, you have several options to look at. Uh, lockdown is the last, is the very last option you want to think of as a country because of the consequences that it brings I mean, toward, uh, to ordinary people. So in events like this, you have, you have some options, some low hanging fruits. So the very first is what I believe in the president's announcement, uh, he made some of this, that one, we should be able to adhere to the protocols, has brought us some guidelines on funerals and how people are to conduct themselves, how people are to behave at parties. You will expect that in the next one or two weeks, I mean, from the time the president made the announcement, there should be at least a reduction in number of new cases a possible active cases and a reduction in deaths if people are to adhere to all the things and the, the pronouncements that were made. But if cases continue to double at a very faster rate and if deaths continue to increase, uh, you will expect that there should be a second level of uh, measure that may involve uh, perhaps a restriction of numbers, could be gatherings or in funerals, in, in parties, in pubs where you can cut down the number of people who can be at a certain point in time. If it's 100, you cut it to 50. If it's 20, you cut it down to five. Conferences will be banned. If that does not work, then you can trigger the next level of restrictions. And the very last option is the lockdown, which some of us are still not in favor of. But I think that there are other things that we can do. And for me, the enforcement is the bit that is likely to help us if we are to go along that line. So let's see how the next one or two weeks will be like. I'm hoping that these measures will have an impact and possibly force 
a reduction in the cases we are seeing. But if nothing happens, then of course, we will expect some second or ten levels of measure uh, to be put in place uh, and to see how the trend will change. I think that areas we can manage such, such as behavior and enforcement and people trying to do what they're supposed to do, I think that we can manage it. And not to get to the point where uh, government will begin to, uh, I mean, pronounce restrictions on schools, on, 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 on people of movement, which may have some dire consequences on all of us. So let's hope that people will behave well and to do things that will not get us to the point where the government will look at some of these sort of options. I, I hope we don't get there. So, so, Dr. Uso, for the Delta variant, uh, what should we be looking out for, I mean, in terms of symptoms, and what extra measures are we supposed to be taking as individuals? Well, in, in terms of symptoms, uh, for now, for most of the data and the literature available, there are some one or two uh, differences people observe, but this is not so significant to even mention. And uh, most of the clinical presentations seem to be similar uh, to what we saw in the alpha variants. Although there are people that have some, 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 some other ailments that may be accompanied, but because the numbers are few, uh, you may not be able to say or project and to say that this is what is happening with the data variant. But in terms of protection, you know, when the alpha variant was in circulation, people were more uh, careful to the point of putting on double masks and others were wearing the N95 masks too, so that they would be well protected. I think that if there is any better time to put on double masks, this, this is the best time to do that because this particular variant, which is almost much stronger and 60% more fit than the alpha variants, meaning that if you even don't fit your max well, you can easily do contact or transmit so aside the hand washing, the physical distancing, and then uh, making sure that you don't stay at enclosed areas and reporting your symptoms whenever you think you have this, I think that for those who are, have, may have underlying conditions and for people who are especially not vaccinated, as much as you can, if you can put on a highly fit mask, even N95 or a double uh, mask, than you know, the double surgical mask, I think that it will be more helpful so that you can, you can ensure that you are well and adequately protected so, so you don't expose yourself to what we are seeing. So we are told that this uh, Delta variant actually has a higher viral load. How much a viral load does it have compared to the others we've seen before? Yeah, so we did a study uh, during the uh, very first wave. Uh, we looked at about 72,000 samples and the average viral load that was associated with the Wuhan and even the alpha variant was about 1,300 copies uh, per mil of sample. Uh, with this particular delta variant, we are here to quantify the load. But if you look at the cycling threshold that we are seeing, uh, it seems to, to be correlating with the values close to 2,000 to 3,000 copies per mil, if you have to quantify it just based on the city values. And other literature has also mentioned that the number of copies of this data variant is, is well over 2,000 copies. So what this means is that because the load is very high, if somebody is infected, he has a chance of transmitting it at a very faster rate. What it also means is that if you also carry the delta variant, because of the high load, it takes a longer time for you to clear the virus. So it is not surprising that with the alpha, in two weeks' time, people may get well, and may get the virus and become negative. But with the Delta, because of the high load of the virus, it is possible for people to live with the virus even after two weeks and still have some residual amount of the virus in their system. So, so the load that, that is being recorded out there looks like something that is, is much higher than the Alpha, maybe in the two or three thousand copies per mail for, for what, for what uh, they have seen so far in the laboratory. I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. Dr. Michael Owusu, he's KCCR virologist and a lecturer at KNUST. Uh, Dr. Michael Owusu, stay on for me, don't go uh, yet, uh, because I want to bring in the other perspectives to this conversation, because there are concerns of a super spreader event that happens tomorrow. Well, the fix the country campaigners have vowed to strictly adhere to COVID-19 protocols in the midst of the COVID, third COVID wave 
when they finally take to the streets this Wednesday for their much anticipated protest. A convener of the group, Urua Ado, says they will roll out a comprehensive COVID-19 strategy for the street protest. Um, listen. Uh, if you're going by the signs of, of COVID, I mean, the signs of COVID, and according to the World Health Organization, yes, um, vaccination seems to be effective when it comes to dealing with COVID. Then again, the most effective way is to mask up and um, maintain your social distance. So basically, if we're all in our mask and we're all um, ensuring that we have um, safety, we're maintaining a, a, a safety social distancing me mechanism, then we should be fine. Um, as part of this, we have um, deployed marshals who would be on the day, who would be guiding um, the people or protesters um, as to how to go about um, the distance and um, ensuring that everyone has their mask on. We would also provide uh, free masks for people who might show up without the masks. But we encourage everyone to show up um, at the protest, on the day of the protest, to show up in a mask and uh, be ready to also social distance, uh, um, take into consideration all the social distancing protocols. So that was a member of the Fix the Country campaign, which happens tomorrow, that protest. Uh, Doc, are these assurances enough considering what we are dealing with at the moment? Um, ideally, uh, you, you want everybody to engage in activity to express their rights and to be able to uh, I mean, I mean, put forward uh, issues that they feel is of much concern to them. But if you are in the acceleration phase of this virus, where uh, cases are doubling uh, almost every, every week, and uh, you have uh, hospitals that are under pressure, I, I, you wouldn't want to, to engage in other things that will put undue uh, pressure on the system, because uh, the same security that are being asked to enforce the protocols at, at various regions, I believe are the same security that to be called in to observe uh, um, these uh, gatherings uh, and these uh, activities to uh, make sure that people are here, people follow through. I'm quite happy that the convener uh, has, has, has some idea about, about the protocols that is going to put in place in terms of looking at physical distancing, ensuring that masks are supplied, ensuring that sanitizers are available for people, and to making sure that everybody who's on the ground do what they're supposed to do. But my fear is that if, if, if people gather beyond their strength, uh, how much more can they do? Uh, it, is, it is likely that in the midst of these large gatherings, people out of excitement uh, may decide to put off their mats, may decide not to even uh, do the things that they are, they are going to do. In that case, what do you do? And if in that case people become infected, you cannot reverse this. It is, it's, it's irreversible. I wish that. If this could be done at the point where you are in the decline phase, you are likely to be safer. But at the high speed acceleration phase, uh, the best will be to uh, either as much as possible uh, reduce this or cut out the numbers, define numbers that can be at a certain point in time. But if you allow things to go through this way, uh, it is possible this may contribute to a very really difficult system that, that we are finding ourselves. So, I, I think they should still look at it as much as possible, reduce the numbers or set some limits. But if they can, uh, postpone to, to a point where you think that we are in a full decline phase and things are normal, uh, that, that point rather may be helpful for, for, for us. Doctor, also before I let you go, just a quick one coming from a viewer. He, um, he wants to find out whether you still advise that people join this demonstration or they should simply call it off, considering the rising in cases? Well, left to me alone, it is better to call it off and rather to look at organizing this when you are in the decline phase. I remember that in the log acceleration phase, cases are rising quickly. And the more people become infected, the more these people are going to put pressure on the health system. We have said that the health system are quite fragile. And the doctors are on the ground, but the cases are still on the rise. And like we said, with this data variant, even if you put on masks, you have a possibility of transmitting. So in such a difficult situation and where cases are rising quickly, 
ideally, we wouldn't want to encourage gatherings of any form because we don't have an upper hand in controlling people. It may get out of hand. And people who innocently will be part of this may be exposed in one way or the other. So if the conveners can, it will be better for them to postpone to a point where we think we are safe and have things more relaxed. But in these states where we find ourselves with cases rising quickly, I think that if they can, they, they should be able to postpone. But then if they, are, if they are not able to postpone, then they have to define the cutoff number in addition to all the protocols they are putting in place to define a limit that they will expect to, to gather and to space enough to allow them to go through the safely so that they don't put the lives of ordinary people at risk. Well, we'll wait for a week or two and monitor with keen interest and see how our situation gets better or worse. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Michael Owusu, for joining us this afternoon. He's a virologist with KCCR and he's also a lecturer at the KNUSC. Meanwhile, in a related development, the Ghana Health Service has denied allegations of poor COVID-19 testing among passengers at the airport, saying such viral complaints are erroneous. Uh, this follows concerns raised by some individuals and the minority in Parliament over what they say is discrepancies in the outcome of COVID-19 testing. Here's Dr. Franklin Isidu Bekwe. He's Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service. He's given modalities for the testing? Um, protocols or guidelines are not static. I mean, they are meant to be reviewed. Mm. And then when you are managing a pandemic, it's kind of a trade-off. So your main focus is uh, to seek the, the safety of the population. Mm -hmm. So somehow, uh, not the best, but we have to side with the population against that individual. Mm. But I think that um, based on whatever is going on, I think that as a country, we need to look at it. We have moved on based on our guidelines over the period. For, for now, as we speak, we do not have that space that you you contest uh, the results at the airport. But it's not a static situation that we may not need to amend it. Mm -hmm. What we are saying is that we were looking at a very sensitive instrument, which is the antigen test. So as because it's so extra sensitive, it's about 99.9, it's possible we have a few false positives. Mm -hmm. So um, let me say that even those who are making the comments, there are instances that people have um, somehow doubted the results, but mm. with time, they've come to accept that that could be true. You yeah. see, just you see, for science, it is there's not like absolute. Mm. I mean, I mean that's the science. Yeah. So and there are individuals who have different idiosyncrasies and different genetic makeup. Mm. So you cannot vary. That's why we give ranges. Mm. So if you look at the spectrum of um, persons coming from uh, outside to the country. So there's one, that's a starting point, which is that do a test. And then the test is that you do an anti um, PCR test. And we are saying that be, be negative. Mm. There are instances that people have come to Ghana with a positive PCR test and the airlines have been fine. If you do that, we, we find you $3,500. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the airlines should be watchful to be sure that people are entering your, your plane mm. are antigen negative. Right. You see, when somebody is coming, as, let's say, assuming somebody could be at the early stage of a positive status, mm. but then to be negative, and he comes to Ghana, and then again is positive. Mm. That guy can, after two, three days, move from antigen positive to antigen negative. It's possible. I mean, let me be also clear. When you have people who have been vaccinated, and whereby they have high utilizing antibodies, Mm -hmm. They have a high probability of clearing their, their virus. So there's nothing like a no-no in science. And I think that we need to be realistic with, with the issues going on. We are that, not saying that's that interesting. Be false. Listen, let me say, mm -hmm. we are not saying that it could not be false positives. What we are saying is that we need to be realistic. Mm. What's alive on the pulse when we return um, 12 regions on red alert over a possible outbreak of bed flu? We have details shortly after this break.
Welcome back to The Pulse. Uh, let's talk about this red alert because Veterinary Services Department has put 12 regions on red alert over a possible outbreak of bird flu. The service says its offices in the five remaining regions of the north, the three Bono regions, the western, western north, eastern and OT regions, have been asked to put in measures to prevent an outbreak. According to the service, as of July 31, 2021, the Greater Accra, Volta Central and Ashanti regions had recorded over 33,000 poultry deaths because of the avian influenza disease. The risk communicator for the Veterinary Service Doc Directorate, Dr. Benjamin Kisi Sesu, he joins me via Zoom for more on this. Dr. Sesu, I'm grateful for your time. Also uh, joining us on Zoom for this discussion is Napoleon Ajemano Drew. He's National President for the Poultry Farmers Association, I'm grateful for your time. Let me start with you, Dr. Um, Sisu, with the vet veterinary services. What is the current situation uh, in the country with regards to the uh, bed flu? Um, thank you very much. I think um, earlier we made, it, made the public aware that on 8 July, we picked our first case in Accra. Then within four days, as we were running tests, we had other regions, which is Central Region, which are joining in. Um, so we wish you a communicate to the whole nation and to our various heads of uh, veterinary offices that what is happening in three regions and there's a need for them to have their response team ready. So any eventuality we are able to handle. Um, for some time, we we're able to go through containing the uh, bed flu in three regions. But we we're only successful that um, just on 31st, which is the last Saturday, the last day of July, uh, we had other, uh, we had Asante region joining. So, so far we have four regions out of the 12 um, having this bed flu outbreak. And uh, with regards to that, we have had um, 33,000 beds affected. And um, we have about 14 farms in this area. Uh, so we have had four hmm. farms in Asante. We have 20 beds affected. We have had 720, uh, 790 which were destroyed for containment, but 13,330 uh, 13, died due to bed flu. That's the clarification. So 33,190 bears were affected. And out of 33,000, um, 13,330 died due to bed flu, naturally. And for containment, um, other bears who were uh, already in those farms that were destroyed, 17,290 bears. And um, crate of eggs and other feedbacks that were found in those places were destroyed. And we also like to let the public know that, including these bears, we had Guinea Faria, Turkey, and Dax were also affected. So, so far, that was on the ground, and we have asked other regions because of the way this virus can be transmitted. Already, one carrier and one um, animal that spread it very fast are migratory bears. And it's easy within a day for a bear to move from one region to another region. Most migratory bears move from other countries to other countries. And earlier, when I made it aware that the virus that we have in Ghana, when it was said, uh, sent to international uh, lab, reference lab for bed flu, which is in Canada, they made it away that the virus we have in Ghana is 99.3% similar to that of what we have in Nigeria. So far, that's what we have. And the human samples have been picked. We are waiting for the uh, results to come out. Um, with one health approach, we went to go to the field with Ghana Health Service and Environmental Health, health Agency to make sure that uh, we fight this out. So this is what is on the ground. And we have letting people know that for Bellevue, two since 2007 that we have had in Ghana, we are able to control. It's so sad that um, we are still having some cases coming in, but we are hoping that as I'm going to these four regions, we don't get into other regions and we are able to contain and have this solved. Dr. So Sato, so hold, hold on for me there. Let me bring in uh, Napoleon Ajimano Drew. He's a national vice uh, chair, uh, vice president of the Poultry Farmers Association. Um, so, Drew, I'm grateful for your time. This directly affects you and your members. Um, tell us the nature of the problem at hand. Hi, good afternoon. And, um, good afternoon to your viewers and listeners. I will say we have been working very well with the veterinary. We heavily depend on them for information related to this outbreak. But we thank God we have a network of almost all the regions having their reps in the national association. So when the national leadership uh, get information from veterinary, we quickly disseminate the information to reach 
our people. In fact, we are in a very critical situation at the moment. Um, it's, it's not the best because we least expected that the outbreak of bear flu will come in our lives at this time. You know, for the last almost one year, we've been battling with the feed shortage, feeding boots shortage. So we never expected that um, we will go through this situation at this time. And you can imagine how difficult it is for us to get feed ingredients. Farmers will have to move to every corner to get the feed ingredients. And just as we least expected the outbreak to occur, today is here with us. As he just confirmed 31st, uh, we had the, the fourth uh, region to be affected by the bear flu, even though we've working um, been working hard together with veterinary to prevent the spread of the disease from the first uh, three regions and central greater Akka and Volta. Uh, we were trying to do everything possible that it would not uh, be sent to the other region, but unfortunately, Ashanti region uh, had been affected. We still are working together with the vet to make sure that this disease will not go to the other regions. Uh, Mr. Draw, the last time we spoke, um, we, I mean, we, we had only three regions that had recorded the bed flu. And we had some advice, uh, pieces of advice coming from the veterinary services. What have you gathered could be accounting for the spread to other regions? Well, Asha, I think um, this, this is a very important question you have asked. See, we, we are running short of the feed inputs. Every farmer in this country is, is uh, having the how to access feed inputs. So I am compelled to move out of my farm. I am compelled to move out of my comfort zone. And by going to search for feed inputs, it, it, it's to say I'm exposing myself to the, the, the disease and I will have to come back to the farm with the disease. No farmer and today sitting in the farm and order feeding with them from a craft mass wherever you can do that. It is to say you have to move before you can get a couple of bags for your, your pets. And that's a possible avenue for us to spread the disease. So farmers, we advise them when you go out and you come in, you have to really, really, really uh, disinfect, make sure that whoever comes to the farm will have to go through the protocols prescribed by the veterinary. I believe if we're able to follow, uh, you know, little stuff like that, we'll be able to prevent the disease from uh, coming to where we are. Dr. Sasu, how did we get here? Um, of course, the last time we spoke, we, we were in just three regions where we had recorded the bed flu. Yes. Now we're talking about 12 regions. And you promised us that you were doing everything within your means to ensure it doesn't spread to other regions. Why are we here now? Yes, uh, we have a part to play, and I was happy the Poultry Farmers Association said they also have a big part to play. And uh, with the one that goes to the Asante region, uh, with investigation was due to poor biosecurity. It means the person, in terms of sanitation of the farm, was so bad. It's easy for people to enter the place. There was no um, proper measures in terms of disinfectant in food bath. All these were not things that were there. So uh, that farm getting wasn't so shocking. And uh, we have advised that strict biosecurity at various farms will help. And I was happy. And there's one thing we are also seeing due to the feed challenge, most farmers are moving out of their comfort zone as you made it know. They all converge at feed um, millers uh, places or uh, where they sell feed. And most of them, when they go back, if you have a poor biosecurity, the chances are high you will send the virus to your farm. Don't forget that people are using their cars to transport all these things. So if you're at your farm at the entrance, you don't have a a roadmap for your car that is to patch through in case you have picked anything. That would be a big problem. So the big work must be done by them at their farm. They are the gatekeepers at the rural farms. They need to make sure that this fashion is very, very, very key in their farms. If not, they could get this virus spreading. And though we have said migratory beds, the wildlife also are on the ground making sure that any dead a bed um, of a wildlife source, when, when reported to them, they will do their best. And when we say we are managing the issue, there's two things you should bear in mind. It means whenever they are, we are being told of any unusual number of deaths of a uh, in a farm, quickly we should come in and stop it at the farm than uh, waiting. So we have both things. And um, as we said, when it is an outbreak, remember uh, viruses, most viruses take up a, a course. Some, uh, some birds will be incubating. So once we had it in Accra, we knew there'll be an 
increase of number because that we want to help reduce it. So right now, after having the Asante region, we will have to monitor for 14 days at least to see whether there will be another outbreak. So if it wasn't only that farmer, and other farms were affected, it will show up within the 14 days. And we are hoping these four regions stay as it is, no even further increase in these regions, and we'll be happy to have it. So all um, stakeholders, especially the farmers who are the gatekeepers at the real farms, need to ensure that their surroundings are very kept well, biosecurity measures are full up. Um, as I said, I know for the poultry association, those who are part of them, they normally get updates from their leadership. Some have not joined. That's another issue with regards to this. And we hope some would, uh, would uh, join and get information from these associations and they'll get expert advice from them. They do organize even symposium workshops for us to speak on that. Um, let us not forget that people who are also not into commercial farm were also had their share. Those were kept keeping the ducks and uh, the turkey, where people were not into commercial. So let's not forget that um, people at their various house who keep this need to be careful. Even if you keep dove, you keep a parrot, you still need to be careful. As I said, the uh, migrating bears play a key role. They can leave their droppings um, anywhere on the compound. You will step in uh, with not a good biosecurity. You will step. A lot of people keep their beds in fields. It means they don't have a place for them to sleep. So uh, the best move around, and those beds are easy to pick it. And one local bears pick it. And people, a lot of people keep local bears at their various places. They don't report cases of death to veterinary. That's another big issue. So those people may be walking around, and um, a farmer may go to a normal shop, not a, a feed place, and going back with a poor biosecurity, we sent to the farm. So these are issues that we have that everybody needs to be alert and make sure that we, we are able to contain this virus. Go ahead and consume our delicious chicken and other poultry products. Yes. Um, if you ask the poultry as a farmers association, this is not new. We have had this uh, outbreak in 2000 and seven, we have had it 2015-2016, so it's not something new. The international uh, community have given us a protocol and they have told us what we need to do. So right now, there's nothing uh, about people not uh, continue to consume. Don't forget, what comes to the market, there's due diligence being done. The fact that one or two farms have gotten it doesn't mean. And so far, we are rest assured that all the farms that we um, went there and were affected, we are we can assure the public that none of the best got into the public. Even the way we get the rest that were alive and the plant buried alone. We, we team up with the assembly, digital assemblies. Excavators are used to dig down, six feet down, disinfect the board. So those carcasses cannot be assumed or dressed for public to eat. So we should go on with our, um, uh, how do you call it, our product and enjoy. Don't forget, Food and Drug Authority also on around moving for, uh, for market to market, making sure that the best is out. And um, the issue is with the movement from other regions to another region, they are aware. If they ask me to do contact the veterinary head office, they will go and do some tests and they will issue permits for that. So we should not be alarmed. Uh, when we get to be afraid of this issue, that's why we begin to panic and do what is not necessary. Dr. Dro, um, what's Let's the role the of the. What was... Our various friends who are farmers, relatives. Dr. Dro, uh, Mr. Dro, what's the role of the um, Farmers Association, Poultry Farmers Association, in helping to contain the spread of this? Uh, bed flu and also ensuring that poultry consumers are safe. Thank you, Asha. I think that anytime we get information from veterinary, we don't sleep over. We try to disseminate information to our network. We have regional executives, we have district executives, and as soon as we get information from bed, we try to make sure that information will go down there. But we are pleading with farmers at this time that with the slightest sign you see, you need not to wait you have to report to the nearest veterinary clinic. Again, wherever you go at this time, you have to take record because- Thanks, whatever, hurry up, it's got to go on. <laughs> you have to do, you have to do- uh, uh, right. It's white and um, uh, 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 Contact tracing. So wherever you go, even in, in terms of searching for, for feeding ingredients, you have to make sure that you take good record of your movement. And also, this is not a time to just throw away um, whatever, like anytime something happens to the farm, you go, you find a dead bed, you throw it away. This is not a time. Try your best to report to the nearest uh, veterinary clinic for advice. If they come in here and they realize it's not bed flu, they will give you the prescription for the appropriate medicine for the treatment of whatever disease that will occur at a farm. 
I'm grateful for your time. Uh, Napoleon Ajemano Drew, he's the National Vice President for the Poultry Farmers Association, and also Dr. Benjamin uh, Kisisesu. He's a risk communicator with the Veterinary Services Directorate at the Greek Ministry. I'm grateful for your time. And from poultry to fertilizers, farmers at Sakogu in the East Mampushi Municipality of the Northeast region are uncertain of a good harvest this year. Their fears are as a result of shortage of fertilizer, leading to an increase in the price of the commodity. Speaking to join you, Cecilia Satanko, the farmers described government subsidized fertilizer intervention under the Planting for Food and Jobs program as a failure. Correspondent Ilya Satanko has more. This long truck has just arrived from Techiman with bags of subsidized fertilizer after making selective stops and dropping down few bags in other communities. Here at Sakugu along the Nalirgu Bunkurgu Highway, several farmers could not wait and have rushed out from their homes to purchase their input. These farmers have desperately been waiting for the arrival of the subsidized material since June when the first consignment was delivered to farmers in certain parts parts of the region. To their disappointment, however, they were informed the supply was not open for sale to the general public, but only a specific group of not less than 80 farmers. But who are these lucky farmers? Assemblyman for the Sakogu electoral area, Adam Tahiru, is a member of the group who spoke to Joy News. What's happening here is it's best for people who have come here with fertilizer for us to put into our farms. Sincerely speaking, it's best for who used to give us this fertilizer during rainy season and after harvesting, we also pay back to them. They give it to us on credit. Without best we wouldn't have even get fertilizer. Without best we wouldn't have even get it. The consignment has been brought in by the Boku East Small Scale Farmers Association to be distributed to only eight customers across the region as part of a pre planned arrangement between the bank and the farmers. The assemblyman said the supply wasn't enough even for the registered customers, while he poured out his frustration over what he said was unprecedented challenges facing the subsidized fertilizer program under this administration. We those in northern region or in northeast region, we are far behind back. We are far behind back. We are not getting anything. I should have even said right from here to Nalegu, it's even our regional capital. It's even our regional capital. We are not even getting somebody there dealing with food and job, planting for food and job. No subsidy in our region. No subsidy. I would say in the region south, I will not say in Sakogu alone. Because even today, I was in Nalegu. I couldn't be able to get even a single mini bag as to sell with subsidy. Never. So me, I don't even understand whether we those in Northeast region, are we part in are we part of Ghana? I'm not sure that we are even part of Ghana in Northeast region. If we were to part of Ghana, planting and food or the subsidy should have even been with us for long. All our crops have swelled. Alidu Isaka is also a certified customer of the bank. He registered eight bags for his two hectare maize farm, but he was given four and a half back. He's not happy and accused the government. So, Governor Makata Fabian and Tehira, Kasoswa, and one and none to us. We are looking up to the government to help end the fertilizer shortage in the region. We should open up the door for our leaders to assess the fertilizer to bring to us. Because we depend on agriculture as a nation, and therefore if farmers fail, the whole nation is going to suffer. Suli Azumi, another customer of the bank, also got a half of her request for 10 bucks. She too is not happy with the government and pleaded with their Greek ministry to make available fertilizers to save their farm crops from perishing. Or she's pleading, or we all are pleading to the Minister of Agri to put effort or to wake up to manage in order for us to get fertilizer to apply, to apply our crops. With that stuff, the, all our crops have even spoiled already. Already our crops are spoiled. Ilyasu Tanko reporting. Let's head to Parliament because it's quite a busy day today. Three issues 
on the board. First, a Jura MP, Mohamed Brimer, who says the report of the three-member committee that investigated the violence there should have recommended removal of the regional minister. He says the recommendation for the removal of just the MCE is not enough. He tells Joy News they are dissatisfied with the recommendations. which was heeded to you by his excellency the president instructing the minister for the interior to institute a committee for the Jura probe the pro uh, the, the Jura, uh, disturbances or shooting incidents in the Jura. the committee has finished its work they've presented their reports uh, i can say for now there's a, a, a calm in the Jura. Uh, but the people have greeted the report of the committee with mixed feelings and myself, representing the good people of Edra, feel that um, the report, the recommendations are okay, but they should have been far-reaching. Because um, if you look at the recommendation, that calls for the uh, dismissal of the municipal chief executive. We all know that the municipal chief executive does not act in the vacuum. He reports to the, uh, the chairman of the regional security council, who is the regional minister, who himself admitted that he... Uh, ordered the deployment of the military. And we all saw that the, the, that deployment uh, ended up in casualties, with uh, two losing their lives, uh, one boy having their leg amp uh, amputated, and then uh, also two other people also getting injured. And so uh, if we are recommending that the municipal chief executive should be removed from office, I feel that the regional minister who ordered that deployment, I call that deployment reckless because uh, when I got to Edra, I found out that almost every right control equipment was in Edra. We had the water cannon, we had uh, my interaction with the soldiers and the, and the, and the, and the, the police commander indicated that they had a, um, uh, rubber bullets and they had a tear gas with them, none of which was used, but rather deployed the army which, who went and then recklessly, uh, I mean, uh, open fire on protesters who were even running away on seeing the military. So, you so think the, the, the committee should have recommended the removal of the regional minister? The committee should have recommended the removal of the regional minister of, or, or heavier sanctions meted out to the regional minister. And then uh, I saw the recommendation that the uh, military officer on the ground should be sanctioned. Which of them? Is it the commander? Because if you look at the work of the committee, they should have even invited the military men who were on the ground, but rather those who appeared before the committee are their officers in Kumasi who were not on the ground but only gave evidence based on hearsay. And uh, we all know that evidence based on hearsay are not are, are normally or always factual. And for that matter, they should have even invited the, the commander who was on, on the ground now that they are recommending uh, uh, sanctions to be taken against him. If you look at the case in Wa, which where even there was no, there was no deaths, uh, only one person seriously injured, uh, we all saw the kind of sanctions that were meted out to the extent that even the recruits who have just passed out have been sanctioned in such a way that they cannot even attain a certain rank in their lifetime in the military. So we feel that the, the reports, the, the sanctions should have been, I mean, the recommendations on sanctions should have been far-reaching so that at least everybody will understand. So, so far, so good. But my problem even is, even with this limited, uh, 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 I mean, I would call it limited recommendations that have been, will they be implemented? Because we've seen some before. We saw Iowa West War Group Committee, uh, that was an inquiry, uh, 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 I mean, a whole commission. The reports that came, the recommendations that came out of the commission's report, I believe. And uh, we're live in parliament this afternoon because there's also the minority leader in parliament, uh, the Harun Idrisu, who is predicting more strikes and other industrial actions in the months ahead. And that will hugely impact the economy. There's also the bit of uh, purchasing um, aircrafts for the armed forces. My colleague Joseph Opoku Gakpo joins me with details of those. Um, Gakpo, I'm grateful that you have a lot of updates from Parliament for us. Let's begin with the EJURA recommendations versus the EJURA MP's concerns. 
Aisha, good afternoon to you. Um, since the committee's reports were submitted, uh, we've all been trying to uh, probably get uh, copies of it and get a sense of what exactly is contained in the report. Um, the member of parliament for the area, uh, Mohamed Brahima, has been seeking to provide some details on what he's gathered are contained in that particular report, including the point being made about the recommendation that the municipal chief executive for the area, who did manage affairs for a number of years, uh, be removed from the position. Uh, there's been further development in that regard, uh, with the indication that the municipal chief executive himself has actually withdrawn his application to step into that position again going forward. That's uh, one of the details that the MP make us makes us understand that is contained in the report, a recommendation that uh, he be removed. He also makes the point that there's a recommendation in the report that the uh, commander who commanded the military team be sanctioned. And he makes the point that to a very large extent, these recommendations are not far-reaching enough. Uh, he's also a member of Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee. And uh, from what we're gathering, uh, at the level of the MPC, they say they are waiting for the president to then go ahead and make the necessary uh, recommendations and uh, take actions with regards to the reports of that committee and it's only after that that they are the level of Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee to actually step in. So uh, they are waiting for the President to then respond officially to that particular report and then the committee itself will deliberate on it subsequently. Um, this afternoon, Gakpo, we are also told about predictions by the minority. Exactly what are the reasons the minority is basing its predictions on? So today, the House has been concluding the commentary and, if you could call it so, the debate on the media budget review statement that was delivered to Parliament last week, Thursday, by the Minister for Finance, Ken Oforiata. And Harina Idrisu, who is the leader on the minority side, has been uh, spending about 45 minutes commenting on that statement. He's been uh, making a number of points, including concerns about industrial actions that are being undertaken by some uh, labor groups in the country. You recall that the University Teachers Association of Ghana has called a strike uh, over the last few days. The minority leader makes the point that more of this can be expected going forward and that this is something that will end up even negatively impacting productivity in the country. And he attributes the situation to what he says has been a uh, government's insensitive approach when it comes to negotiations on the a basic pay rise for this year and next year. You recall that government did announce that um, public sector workers are getting a 4% rise in their salaries. Uh, well, the minority makes the point that this is very much on the low side, especially when the average, you know, the average inflation rate, Aisha, is somewhere around um, 8%. And so the minority makes the point that they would want to see the rate when it comes to the rise in basic pay being at least that said 8% instead of the 4% that government announced. And for the minority leader, Harina Idrisu, unless that necessary adjustment is done, more of such possible labor actions can be expected going forward. He's also been commenting on the country's debt situation, which he insists is very much on the high side and should be dealt with to a certain extent. He's also been commenting on the National Cathedral Project, and he says that... Um, aware that the finance minister has previously announced that government was sinking in about $10 million. He says that when the... My colleague Joseph Opokugako, they're bringing us up to speed on happenings in Parliament. Uh, we'll try and get him back because the Ministry of Defence has also laid in Parliament for approval a uh, 111 million euro agreement that will allow it to purchase six aircrafts for the Ghana Armed Forces. They deal with aero, aerospace and of, of the Czech Republic includes support services for the six aircrafts. Now the deal will also see the company supply six L39 next generation L3NG L39LG aircrafts and the provision of support of terms of product services and ground-based training system associated with the aircraft operation. Specifically, they're talking about the agreement which is worth of um, 111 um, million 393,400 um, euros. The agreement was laid in Parliament also on Monday and Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagman, 
has referred that agreement to the Defense and Interior Committee. My colleague Joseph Opoku Gakpo is back uh, with more for us. Gakpo, you were talking about the minority's prediction. I would let you finish up that and also let you in on this um, agreement that has, that has been um, submitted for approval by the Defense Minister. So Aisha, to uh, round up with that, the minority leader essentially makes the point that the surest way government can get out of the difficulty the economy finds itself in currently is for it to possibly go to the International Monetary Fund and request for debt relief services. Otherwise, then the economy will continue to struggle going forward. There's been responses to that from the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs and the majority leader, Osaichi Mensa Bonsu, who insists that the management of the economy over the last four years has been far better than what the NDC did back in 2016 and earlier than that. And then he used uh, the word incompetence to describe how the NDC managed the economy then. And then made the point that uh, people should be appreciative of how well the government has managed the economy, even in the times of the COVID-19 pandemic, because without the very deliberate and conscious effort by government to better manage the economy, Ghana would have seen a lot of trouble. So the debate on that concluded um, about two hours ago in Parliament and the House uh, went ahead and made the point that uh, because the finance minister did not ask for any specific approvals in terms of a supplementary budget, they only debated and went ahead and um, acknowledged that statement that was delivered to the House. And then subsequently, uh, the President of Angola has been addressing Parliament and been making the point that uh, both countries, Ghana and Angola, need to work together to root out corruption in the public service and ensure the advancement of the lives of the people. Uh, yes. Let's talk about the um, agreement on the purchase of aircrafts for the Ghana Armed Forces. That was laid in the House on Monday, right? Gakpo? All right, so and I think... The house with, um... A report on Aisha, are you able to hear me, Aisha? Yes, loud and clear. So let me uh, round up on that very quickly. Um, the Committee on Defense and Interior is considering that document. Considering that document after it was laid in Parliament yesterday. It's an agreement to the tune of 111 million euros to purchase six L-39 next generation aircrafts for the Ghana Armed Forces and Beyond just the purchase of the aircraft, the Czech Republican company that's supplying it, that um, Aero Vodochodi Aerospace AS, will also be providing support for um, the aircraft in question, including uh, providing uh, services and then ground-based training systems associated with the operation of this particular aircraft for the Ghana Armed Forces. Already, we've had some minority MPs make the point that uh, this is a deal that's very much on the high side because then the details that they're gathering have to do with the fact that uh, this is an aircraft that could well have been bought somewhere in the region of $10 million for each of them. We should possibly take the holistic figure for the 6 to something like $60 million rather than the 111 million euros as we've seen contained in the agreement that has been laid in the house. But they indicate that they will provide more details on their content subsequently. Aisha. Joseph Opoku Gakpo um, reporting from Parliament. We're still in Parliament and we're monitoring events. We'll bring you more updates in our subsequent bulletin. Now, the lawyer at the center of the alleged $5 million bribe involving the Chief Justice has sued the General Legal Counsel. Kwesi Frifa is asking the High Court to set aside the proceedings of the General Legal Counsel's Disciplinary Committee meeting held in July, August, uh, July against him. He contends the said meeting was wrongfully, um, was wrongful, illegal, and contrary to the rules of natural justice. The Disciplinary Committee had earlier decided to slap the legal practitioner, Kwesi Frifa, with nine charges for misconduct. There's more in this news desk report.
CID insisted he did nothing wrong. I came here voluntarily. N nobody uh, arrested me and I've come to finish my business. I have not done anything wrong. If you look at the accusations against me, I have given my response. The response is now public knowledge. The General Legal Council, after its preliminary inquiry into the allegations, concluded that a case of misconduct had been established against him at the first impression. The GLC then proceeded to slap Kwesi Afrifa with nine charges for misconduct, indicating that lawyer Afrifa's statement was reckless and imputed judicial manipulation by the Chief Justice, thereby diminishing public confidence in the administration of justice and that he knew or ought to have known that the reckless statement suggesting judicial manipulation by the Chief Justice was false. A free fire also faces the charge of having failed to protect the sanctity and integrity of the legal profession when he failed to disclose the allegation of bribery against the Chief Justice to the Disciplinary Committee of the Judicial Council or any other statutory body for an inquiry. The GLC also observed that lawyer Kwesia Frifa failed to defend the reputation of the legal profession and rather facilitated the commission of the alleged bribery offence when he refunded legal fees he was entitled to and at the same time failing to issue any receipts to his former client. Mr. Frifa, in this latest twist, argues the disciplinary committee engaged in procedural impropriety. He is therefore asking the court to stop the GLC from embarking on any hearing flowing from its first meeting where a prima facie case was made against him. A 48-year-old man who shot and killed his partner at a Swofia Isamang in the Ashanti region of a threat of divorce has died. Bashiru Naneaba died hours after being rushed to the hospital for that for attempting to commit suicide. He's believed to have taken in poisonous substance minutes after committing that heinous crime. Amavida was shot in front of a single room apartment at the Sofua Samai new site. The area looks bushy with uncompleted buildings. It was a sad moment when 14-year-old Comfort Kulani, daughter of the deceased, narrated what she saw before the death of her mother. I told my dad not to shoot my mom. I wanted to save her, but I couldn't. He nearly shot me while I was screaming for help. My mom is the only one who takes care of us. Her younger sister and two brothers, including the deceased stepson, who is older than them, were sitting on a bench outside. A brother to the deceased, Daniel Larry, says the man has four children with a sister, though he was yet to perform customary marriage rites. He says the couple settled their relationship challenges the day before the man carried out the act. After dining with my in-law, I advised him to desist from quarreling with his wife. Bashiru's daughter, Comfort Kolani, says she would run away any time he sees the father. She says her late mother, Hamavida, was the one taking care of them. <laughs> I will run into the bush when I see my father. I knew my father did not have any good intentions for us. It's my mother taking care of us. The suspect has been arrested and is in custody of a Sufa police. The police suspect he has taken a poisonous substance and needs medical attention. The body of the deceased has been deposited at the Confederate Teaching Hospital Mortuary. Let's go on Zoom and speak with Prince, Ap speak with Prince Apia, who has an update. Uh, with He joins us with that update, uh, Prince Apia. Uh, tell us more about this. Hello, Prince Apia. All right, so we are unable to 
uh, we're having a challenge uh, there. We'll try and get Prince up here to tell us how the man who killed his wife himself also is dead. We'll be telling us more on that one. But after failing to raise enough money for orthopedic surgery, a 56-year-old woman suffering from complications in the motor vehicle accident is battling for her life. A reliance on herbal and traditional treatments rather than specialist medical care has resulted in the deterioration of certain bones in her upper left arm. Her condition is worsened by continuous abnormal and excessive bleeding. Doctors say Janet Efriye requires immediate surgery to prevent bone loss and correct fractures in a deformed position. Or him interior of our health desk has come through with this report. Madame Janet Efriye hails from Banco near Efjase in the Ashanti region. The widow is surrounded by her seven children in front of her room. Here, she withers in pain as she rests her bandaged left arm on a pad. Madam Efriye, a trader in fruits and vegetables at Kumasi Central Market, was returning home with two of her kids when disaster struck on the outskirts of Banco. They were a few minutes away from home when the taxi they were traveling in some assorted several times after a head-on collision with another car. At about 7.50 p.m. on August 6, 2020, she had asked the driver to kill his speed before the accident occurred. That accident has rendered her left arm ineffectual and her condition keeps deteriorating as several bone tissues are destroyed. The once vibrant and active breadwinner of the family is now forced to survive on the benevolence of others. Doctors at the Pope John Paul II Medical Center in Jamasi say Madame Efriye needs urgent medical surgery to correct her worsening condition. Dr. Simon Bacon is a medical officer at the facility. The bone setters couldn't really help to restore the arm into its functional state. And therefore, that's what is called more union. And because of that, she apparently cannot do anything with that limp. It's extremely bad to the sense that she cannot carry anything. She cannot hold anything. And so basically, the, the, the arm is just there for the sake of it. The widow has also been suffering from postmenopausal bleeding a disorder that causes her to bleed abnormally and excessively for several months after she has reached menopause. Because <laughs> Medical experts fear Madame Janet Efriye may be suffering from endometrial carcinoma, cancer of the inside lining of the womb. Dr. Foster Kwaununu is a consultant obstetrician gynecologist at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. Every postmenopausal woman needs to have the inside lining of the womb not to be thicker than four millimeters. Now from the scan that I have seen, she has about 13 millimeters or 1.3 centimeters, which is about three, more than three times the average thickening of the endometrial lining. An urgent diagnosis and treatment have been recommended. The biggest problem in this woman, which is already suffering, is the continuous bleeding and that can push her into being to become anemic or loss of blood to the point that her blood levels will be low and that alone can even kill her. This endometrial carcinoma can also spread to other parts of the, her body and give her the problems and then kill her uh, in the long run. Unfortunately, 
Madame Frie, who lives on the benevolence of residents of Banco, cannot afford the cost of treatment. In her current living state, it will take years for Madame Frie to raise the money for her treatment. We need support. The support that we can use to maybe remove all that sickness from his stomach and treat what is happening in the house so that he, she will be set free. Until help comes, the life of Madame Efriye and that of her seven children will continue to hang in the balance. From Banco in Ashanti region for Joy News, Ohim Interior reporting. Ohim Interior uh, with that report. Uh, we'll take a break on the pulse. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to The Pulse. Remember to tweet us at, at us with the hashtag The Pulse. And my personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Now, the Ghana Statistical Service has for the second time announced an extension of the 2021 population and housing census to the 8th of August 2021. Briefing the Media Monday, government statistician Samuel Kobnani revealed enumeration has crossed 99% in 15 regions in the country, with the exception of the Greater Accra region, which still stands at 93%, and that's the, for the extension. In today's highlight, I'm going to highlight four main issues in terms of where we are with the 2021 population and housing census. It is important to know that data keeps coming through, so the data that we are sharing with you today is based on data that came through as at the end of 31st um, July 2021. We are still expecting data to come through from the work that was done yesterday and in the coming days. As a data, as a, as a data for 31st July 2021, in all the 16 regions, 15 of them had crossed 99%, with the exception of Greater Accra, that we are still with 93%, and we're going to work to ensure that the 7% outstanding for Greater Accra will be achieved. Indeed, in all the regions that have crossed the 99%, it doesn't necessarily mean that data collection is ongoing. As I indicated, one, data is flowing through to head office, so we are optimistic that once we analyze the data, we'll be hitting the 100% um, mark. Also, for purposes of data quality, as we indicated in our last release, we had to go back to some of the households to ensure that household validation and correction of errors is done. With all these, Ghana Studies Car Service will be redrawing from the field on the 8th of August. That is, this coming Sunday, we're going to bring a complete closure to the data collection activities. And our next update will be when we'll be sharing with you provisional results from the 2021 Population and Housing Census. She further announced that some eight districts within the Greater Accra region, including the West and Lejokuko, will be focused on within these last few days to ensure everybody in the country is counted. Enumeration from the district point of view has been completed in all the districts that we have. As you are aware, Ghana Studies Card Service has 272 Studies Card districts. In all the districts that we have in the country, but for eight districts, we have completed the enumeration exercise. The third headline is that household validation and correction of errors would continue to go on to ensure that our data is of good quality and it serves the purpose for which it is intended to. So household validation and correction of errors are currently ongoing. The eight districts that we are focusing on intensely in the coming days are as follows. Ga West, Pokatamanso, and Ga North. These are three districts that we necessarily have to continue work in because they are rapidly, rapidly growing areas. So we are still doing um, listing and enumeration in these areas. And these are Ga West, Punkatamanso, and Ga North. The other five districts that we'll continue to work on in the coming days are Adenta Municipality, Lankwantanan Madina Municipal, Ga East, Tema West, and Lejokuku. So these are the eight districts that we'll continue to work in, but as was indicated, come Sunday 8th, um, August 2021, we're going to bring complete closure to the field activities, and we're going to pull all our men out and work on the data analysis. Reasons why we would have to do that, as I indicated, we're going all out to ensure that every person is counted in the country. 
As you are all aware, our slogan is that everybody counts, so we need to count them. You count, get counted. We've made several efforts to ensure that people who have blatantly refused the data collection activities, we, we convince them to participate in the exercise. We still have some challenges, and we are using different medium to ensure that such persons are enumerated. And that's where we draw the curtains on the pulse this afternoon. It's indeed always a pleasure to host you. Do enjoy the rest of our program.